It's, I don't think it's anyone's property. Your I intellectual think. property is not your property? Intellectual property is not property. Intellectual property is a metaphor. No, they are absolutely not my property. They're your property if you buy them. But they're your property. Which books. is the whole point of this DRM business, right? If you buy a device that's your property mm -hmm. and you're reading my book, why should I be able to trump your physical property rights in that device by being able to enforce policy against it when it actually belongs to you? So are you going to mind if I metaphor? set up a stand outside your book talk tonight and sell your books? And sure, but not it? because it's my property. My daughter is not my property, and there's a bunch of things you could do to her that would upset me. Why is the only thing that we value property? Because it's I have a, it's, an interest it's in your, it. It's, cre it's your creation. Look, it's, you know it's, what? It's no different than somebody that builds a jet engine or, or creates a new Well, if that's vehicle, the case, then you I mean, only get paid for it once, right? right? If I make a jet engine and you buy it for me, I never get paid again. You have a copyright on it, though. Something oh, well, so it's it. not like a jet engine. It's like a book. It's its own no, thing. No, that's what I'm saying. Right, if so it's, it's nothing like a jet I engine. It's exactly like a book. And in fact, you're giving copies of your book away. People well, can download yeah. them for free online. Well, it's, it's interesting that you brought up DRM again, because we have a tweet from Kevin who says, let's not forget that publishers are using DRM to manipulate sales and to keep digital books out of the hands of library users. And Lisa, I think this segues really nicely into a discussion about Aaron Schwartz, who, of course, you knew very well. Corey. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron was actually killed in January this year. For those who don't know, he killed himself. Um, after he was charged federally with two counts of wire fraud and 11 violations of computer fraud, of violating rather the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for systematically downloading academic uh, journal articles. Corey, you knew him. He was the founder of Demand Progress, which launched the campaign against internet censorship bills like SOPA. Uh, you know, what's, what's your take on what happened to Aaron? Well, so I think Aaron cared not one whit about the freedom of information. Uh, I think Aaron cared a lot about the freedom of people. And I think that if you look at the, the places where Aaron put his sights on, like, for example, liberating the American uh, jurisprudence, so the laws of America, mm -hmm. which could cost thousands of dollars to research because it, th they were behind a federal paywall instead of out in the public where they should be. Um, uh, you, you see that what he's with the thread that joins them all up, the thread that joins up uh, uh, liberating science that the public has already paid for, but which is locked up in journals and which describes the information that you need to be, by definition, well informed, right? You need to know what scientists have discovered to be well informed, not least every couple of years when someone asks you for a vote based on their theory of how the world works. It'd be nice to know if it conforms to the available evidence, especially when you've already paid to have that evidence gathered. And I think people are freer when they know these things. People are freer when they have access to the law. People are freer when they have access to, uh, to scientific information. And people are certainly more free when uh, their devices aren't uh, locked down in some way that's illegal for them to find out about. Well, Dan, in our Hangout, I know you want to get in on this conversation. Go ahead. Well, I would only point to the difference in uh, public money versus private money in this situation. And in both the hacks, the first one that the FBI started tracking Mr. Schwartz was a PACER system, which is public information funded by taxpayers. And in the second case, uh, a good majority of the articles he was downloading were actually funded by public money. So it's a real question about property rights when you're talking about publicly funded property or intellectual property. Right, so what happens, Corey, to the people uh, that don't have maybe the backing uh, that, that Aaron had? Um, you know, friends like Laurie Lessig, who mm -hmm. was on the show not too long ago, friends well, like I you. I think we know what happens because 97% of the people who receive a federal indictment in this country plead guilty. So either we have the greatest prosecutors in the history of the world who only get it wrong 3% of the time, or the threat of long sentences in an inhumane prison system that's so overcrowded the Supreme Court is ordering California to release prisoners who haven't served their sentences because whatever they've done, it doesn't warrant the human rights abuses that are rampant in our own prison system. Mm -hmm. uh, they use this coercion to force people to plead guilty to crimes that they believe they're not guilty of or things that they don't believe are crimes. I mean, what happened to Aaron is just part of a larger pattern of incarceration. And the congressional testimony this week on Aaron's arrest and his subsequent prosecution, the prosecutor suggested that the reason that they continued Aaron's prosecution after the full details of what had happened came to light is they felt that they would be embarrassed if it turned out that they'd arrested someone. Corey, I got to pause didn't you there to jail. because the television portion of the program is over. We'll pick up where we're leaving off right now. It's streamed at aljazeera.com. So head that way and we'll see you in 10 seconds.
Welcome back to the Online Post Show. We're going to pick up right where we left off. Corey Doctoro, finish your thought. So if the, if the fact is that we have a system that is stacked against individuals where federal prosecutors, once they set your sights on you, you go to jail regardless of your guilt or the justness of the law that you've been, that you've been indicted under, there's only one way we can, we can fix it and that's by organizing. And there's only one tool we have these days to organize, and that's the internet. When I was an activist in the 1980s, 98% of my job was stuffing envelopes and writing addresses on them, and 2% was figuring out what to put in the envelopes. And we get the envelopes for free now. And so keeping the internet free and open, making it so that, for example, you can't just say, oh, that infringes copyright, take it down, without any proof, uh, um, making it so that that's not woven into the legal fabric of the internet, uh, is really important because we've seen that in politics, copyright uh, uh, notices are a common way of silencing political opposition, bogus copyright notices for which there are no appreciable penalties. So you mentioned activism and online organization. How do you organize a cause online without using surveillance-friendly technology? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, Facebook has, is, is kind of the, the paradox of the activist, right? Because there yeah. they all are, but right. there they all aren't. But here's a great example of a tool that we used in the SOPA fight that made a huge difference that Aaron actually helped build along with the Fight for the Future people, which was a tool that you could put up on your website. Now, SOPA had a provision that said if you have a website, you have to police everything everyone posts to it for right. copyright infringement, which is kind of impossible because you'd have to make sure they didn't link to websites where anyone infringed copyright. So if someone linked to Tumblr, you'd have to see everything on Tumblr and make sure it didn't infringe copyright and there are things you will never unsee no matter how hard you try if you see everything on Tumblr. So you could put a little widget into your website that when people came it would say, hey I see you, um, you like my website, I'm gonna have to shut it down if this dumb law passes, what's your zip code? And you enter your zip code and it says, oh well here's your congressman, here's your senator, here's how they stand on it, here's a button you can click to phone them up. And we put eight million phone calls through to Congress that way and retain no data. Right? So there's a very privacy-friendly way of reaching 8 million Congress, uh, of, of having 8 million constituents reach their congressmen and senators. But you know there's so many people sitting out there that they, they know how to use their computer well enough to get on, do what they mm. need to do, and that's it. And they wonder everything, every time something pops up, am I being tracked? Is mm -hmm. this being stored? How uh -huh. do you know? Well, you don't. But say we were talking about waterborne parasites instead, and you said, well, how do I know about all the microscopic things that might be in my tap water that could be killing me at this moment? I don't have a microscope. I'm not a microbiologist. The thing is, we don't put microbiologists in jail or threaten them if they discover bad things in the water supply. But we do threaten researchers who discover bad things going on on the internet. We allow kind of uh, toxic dumping into the internet of bad privacy, anti-privacy technology. In Canada, where I'm from, they've proposed a, a spyware or a, an anti-spam law and the entertainment industry has said, yeah, you can have an anti-spam law, but we want an exception that lets us secretly plant spyware that surveils and deletes files on people's computers, malicious software that goes straight into their computers if we think that it helps us defend copyrights, right? So um, we would never say to an industry, well, your profit maximiza maximization strategy means that you can sometimes put intestinal parasites into the water. Well, actually, we sometimes do it to big ag, but that's the problem, right, isn't it? That we, we live in a system where profits trump public health, and, and the way that we organize to, to fix that is by using networked tools. Well, this tweet from Mikey kind of sums up what people are saying. The crux of the discussion is if people want privacy, piracy or free information. But there's a video comment here, Corey, uh, from a member of our community asking a question. Have a listen. Hi, my name is Dan Masolia, and I'm a student studying internet law at IIT Chicago Kent in Chicago, United States. My question is that if companies and governments are unwilling to protect data privacy, what can a user do to protect it on his or her own? Thank you. So what can we do? Well, I mean, there's a bunch of things that you can do for your own hygiene, the equivalent of getting your own water filter at home, right? You can, you can use a free and open operating system, not because you're going to look at all the source code in it and make sure that there's no bad stuff lurking in it, but at least the free and open stuff, no one gets into trouble if they out it for doing something bad. So the bad stuff tends to get discovered and fixed really quickly. So I use a flavor of Linux called Ubuntu, mm -hmm. which you can install on any Mac or PC, and which works brilliantly. I've been using it for years, and I haven't missed... Uh, the commercial operating systems one little bit. Um, you can use good encryption. Uh, you can encrypt your hard drive. You can use proxies like the, the Pirate Bay actually operates one of the best proxies out there, uh, iPredator, which is five dollars a month and gives you an enormous amount of, of privacy when you're using the internet. And you can use ad blockers. All of those contribute. But ultimately we don't solve this individually. We solve this collectively. 
So technology can make us better or worse. What, what path do you think we're on right now? Well, I think you have to be an optimist and a pessimist. I'm a pessimist because I think if we do nothing, it will get very bad indeed. I mean, when you look at the extent to which spyware can, can compromise people, you know, there were seven rent-to-own companies and a, and a, uh, a laptop security software who entered into a settlement with the FTC last September because the laptop security software let them turn on the cameras and the microphones and the laptop over the internet, read the keystrokes and the hard drive and the screen. And they stipulated in their settlement with the FTC that they had been secretly video recording their customers having sex, secretly video recording their children in the nude, miking their conversations, grabbing their passwords, their confidential medical, financial, and legal records and conversations, as well as plundering their hard drives just for the fun of it. And the FTC, they said, well, you can't do this anymore unless you put it in the terms and conditions. Right? That was their answer. Unless you if put you, it in the If you put it in the fine in the print, giant. somewhere in that long document mm -hmm. that says, you know, by being dumb enough to use this service, you agree that we're allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother in the mouth and wear your underwear and make long distance calls <laughs> and eat all the food in your fridge. Um, you're, you're okay with it. So it could get bad, right? If that's, mm -hmm. the, if that's the, the way, if that's the gravitas which with, we, with which we regulate the nervous system of the 21st century, like it was nothing more than the second coming of video on demand or a new kind of telephone or the world's most perfect pornography distribution system, then that's what we'll get. But I'm an optimist because I believe that if we do something about it, we can make it better, right? If you look at the SOPA fight, when I was in DC a week before the SOPA fight, everyone I knew on the Hill, all my, all my Hill rat insider friends, they said, go home, forget about it. They've counted the votes. The industry's pushing for this, have so much money invested in these congressmen that they'll never defy them. They've counted up the signatures. You're going to lose. Figure out what to do about a world where SOPA is the law. Don't try and fight SOPA. And instead of taking that advice, internet activists who are outside the Beltway organized in ways that the world had never seen and just kicked the crap out of it. Right? Uh, by the end of it, the co-sponsors of that bill were rushing to beat each other to the microphone to issue statements opposing the bill that they were co-sponsors on. You've got 20 seconds left to wrap this up. Um, I guess I should say I have a new book out, and it's called Homeland. And you're doing a book talk tonight in D.C. for anyone who is in D.C. at Busboys and Poets at 6.30, right? Thank you very much. Corey, yep. Dr. O, thank you for being on our show. Thanks to everyone in our Google Hangout. Before we part entirely, Malika has a few other stories we're following. Instagram users will now have a new location to add to their geotagged photos of cats, food, and trees. North Korea is freeing up access to mobile internet, but there's a catch. The Next Web reports that only foreigners and visitors will have access to the expanded service. Journalist Jean Lee may have been the first to Instagram from within North Korea. She captured signs welcoming nuclear test scientists to Pyongyang. Her Instagram feed contains more pictures of the city. Our next lead comes from Pakistan, where a rare countrywide power outage left residents in the dark for two hours. Netizens got the hashtag blackout trending during the outage. On Twitter, several shared pictures of their surroundings, while others put a humorous spin on the matter, posting pictures like these. Authorities attributed the blackout to a plant malfunction. Well, after electricity returned to Pakistan, Faiza summed up the blackout with this tweet. Proud of Pakistan, a nation that handles blackout type situations in a positive, humorous way. Everyone remembers how New York handled it. Lastly, the internet is still all abuzz following Hollywood's biggest night, but the Oscar win for one of Sunday's films may not have been possible if not for an iPhone. The film Searching for Sugar Man tells the story of an American musician who becomes wildly popular in South Africa, but the filmmakers ran out of money before the movie was complete. The director turned to a vintage camera iPhone app to shoot the remaining scenes, and he was rewarded. The film won the best documentary feature. Now, these are just a few of the stories we're following, so let us know which ones have caught your eye using the hashtag AJStream. Lisa? All right, on Tuesday, one year after the controversial killing of Trayvon Martin, is distrust in the police drawing a rift between the American public and those who protect them? Send us your thoughts and your questions on that, and until then, we'll see you online.